without a good disclaimer, there is a, no webinar that can really take place. So really this disclaimer very quickly, um, it says that we're not a registered broker dealer, one best ourselves. In fact, our partner Wealthforge is, and then also that we are not recommending any of the deals that are actually, you know, going to be discussed today and, and so forth. So that's uh, for the disclaimer. Now, uh, as you see here, we've been um, thankful and also privileged enough to receive great mentions from some of the biggest media outlets in, in the country and, ho and, and, and of course around the world as well. No? And we see there Barbara Corcoran, who is one of our advisors from the TV show Shark Tank. In fact, if you tune in and, and you watch uh, season six, you will be able to find myself wearing a suit. Thank God that was the only time I have been wearing a suit since uh, I was a lawyer. So it was five years ago and there was a lot of dust that I had to take out of, of that suit that I was wearing. So one best, as I was mentioning, we really um, um, are proud to uh, democratize this entire process of how the, the venture financing works. We, um, as I was uh, discussing, we have one of the largest ecosystem, uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems uh, out there right now. We have over 50,000 founders that are registered and then also 15,000 investors that are registered within our uh, OneBest uh, platform. So I was mentioning that we, um, OneBest, are the result of a merger that took place last year. And uh, we have one base really as the ecosystem where the financing takes place. But then we have our sister site that is called Co-Founders Lab, where we are uh, having co-founders meeting one another. So I would say that the big advantage that we have here at OneBase is not only the fact that we're capturing companies that are at the fundraising stage, but then also at the formation stage, because for example, the Co-Founders Lab uh, website it has a white label solutions that are used by a, a startup hubs such as Harvard, MIT, Michigan, Cornell, in accelerator programs such as Techstars, for example. No? So those are all companies that are going to be formed under the umbrella of OneBest and later on would we'll be seeking a round of financing uh, with us as well. So that's uh, something that uh, we're very happy uh, about providing no, to, to our founders and then also to the to the investors because at the end of the day it is proven that one of the biggest reasons why startups fail is because there is problems between the co-founders. So I think that the fact that we are providing this uh, service and then also that there is a certain uh, matchmaking that has been a, you know, well thought out like we had the, the Kaufman Foundation helping with the research to put this together and so forth back in the day, it really makes a difference. So. When we're talking about startup investing, um, I guess that there's a lot of people that uh, now are labeling it as a equity crowdfunding, right? I mean, when we first started uh, doing what we're doing now, uh, it was uh, back in 2010 uh, when we formed the company, the word crowdfunding didn't even exist. It was not in the dictionary. And then also the Jobs Act was also not there. So the Jobs Act, uh, to give you guys a really quick overview, is this new regulatory landscape that was introduced by Obama. And the, basically what this does is, is it's actually one of the biggest changes in the financial service uh, space in the past 80 years. And basically there is uh, two important sections in there. One is the Title II, which was actually implemented in 2013. Uh, and basically that title, what it lets is startups advertise the fact that they're raising money and that's done via general solicitation. So before it was completely forbidden as a startup to be able to go out there to perhaps use social media or blog post or other methods to really connect with your own customers, the people that know you the most. And it was more kind of like a word of mouth game. And this really made it complicated for startups to be able to get in front of investors, in front of people like yourselves, right? That you are looking as to, you know, like how to get behind innovation, how to uh, diversify your portfolio and so forth. So that was the title two of the Jobs Act. Now, talking about the title three of the Jobs Act, uh, this has not been implemented yet. Uh, there is a, obviously drafts that are out there for everyone to read. Uh, we thought that, uh, you know, initially when this, uh, was, this law was passed and and the Congress instructed the SEC to draft the, regu the regulatory landscape. We thought that the implementation of this was going to be on January 
uh, of 2013. Obviously, this has not been the case. But this Title III, essentially, what it does is it lets also non-accredited investors to be able to invest in startups. So for the past eight years, obviously, only accredited investors were able to invest. This is only 1% of the U.S. population, or 8 million households. And this uh, Title III is going to help uh, to, to really explode the, the, the market, right? Because uh, now, once this is implemented, over 300 million people are also going to be able to invest in startups. And I know that some of you may be thinking, oh my God, uh, there is going to be a lot of people that don't have the knowledge or are not professional investors that are, go are going to lose a lot of money. And the real truth is that there is certain limitations or restrictions that come with this Title III for non-accredited investors. So, for example, if you are under the accredited definition, which is $200,000 in income or $1 million in assets, we would touch, ba we would touch on that a little bit later. Uh, basically, what happens is that um, you're a non-accredited investor. So non-accredited investors that are making uh, under $100,000, obviously under this framework that is currently not implemented yet, that means that uh, uh, you can only invest up to 5% of your income under that 100000 threshold. But if you're making over $100,000 but still not meeting the accredited investor definition, that means that you're going to be allowed to invest up to 10% of uh, whatever you're making. So that's for the Jobs Act. Um, we're definitely very excited about the Jobs Act. We are only operating for accredited investors, uh, one best, and uh, obviously we would like to see the final regulatory landscape before we make any decisions on jumping into the non-accredited uh, uh, space. So as I was uh, mentioning briefly, uh, or perhaps I didn't really introduce one best, OneVest, what it is, is a startup investing platform where we connect early stage companies with accredited investors. So the beautiful thing about what we're doing is that now investors can actually go ahead and invest from the comfort of their house. I mean, we have different things like I will introduce say, a little bit later, like demo days, where you get to see these startups pitching and defending their business real time, which is very uh, exciting to actually be doing from the comfort of your house, keeping your privacy, nobody knows that you're there. And only in the event that you want an introduction to that startup, we will actually go ahead and, and do so. But really, in essence, one based thing, as you will be able to find if you go to the website, there is a different startup investment opportunities that you can actually take a, an investment on and, and, and review and, and, and source. And this is something that never existed uh, before. It was more of a of a game of uh, the Silicon Valley insiders. And now you can be in Chicago or you can be, for example, in New York, and you can perfectly well uh, review these different deals that uh, before were not uh, accessible to, um, to, to, to people outside of this uh, ecosystem there in, in the Bay Area. No? So those startups are uh, sourced from top programs. Only between 2 to 4%, I would say, of the startups that apply to actually be listed or fundraise under the One Best umbrella are accepted. And uh, we pride ourselves from really building a marketplace in which we have always, always, always quality versus quantity. So with that being said, I can talk about the due diligence uh, a little bit later once we continue to move forward with the presentation here. But that's something that we are also um, really uh, executing on. So. The type of deals that we have on OneBest, uh, we're looking at seed stage deals, bridge uh, deals, and then also Series A type of deals. So now, I know that when we're talking about fundraising, the fundraising life cycles, we're, there's always like a lot of different series and different life cycles, and I know it can get confusing. But really, when we're talking about these different life cycles that we are hosting at OneBest, we're talking about deals that, for the most part, go from 500,000 to uh, all the way up to 5 million. Uh, we've had some exceptions of deals that went up to raise uh, $10 million, but really the sweet spot is on the early stage. Uh, and as you see here, we have 60% that are on the early stage or growth stage, and then the other ones are seed stage companies, companies that have been in business one year, two years, and that they are ready to get some outside financing. So the, most of the companies that we have really uh, are well, not only uh, tech-enabled companies, companies that have the potential to become a high-growth uh, business with the opportunity to give the investor that exit in uh, in the five-year uh, time frame or horizon. But most of the startups that we host are either in the healthcare space, uh, also in the consumer, 
B2B or B2C amongst others. I mean, here you will be able to find some of the different verticals that, that we have. No? And as I was mentioning earlier, uh, the companies are sourced from top programs, uh, programs like, for example, the universities that you see here uh, that are already using uh, our technology, our co-founders lab technology to found teams, but then also we're using accelerator programs and then also venture capital um, uh, investors no, that are very sophisticated. In fact, one of the biggest, uh, I would say, requirements to be able to launch on the platform is the fact that you either have already a lead investor, a sophisticated lead, and I would uh, uh, talk about that in a little bit, or uh, that you are raising via convertible note round in which you already have some momentum and some traction built. I will talk about the differences between equity rounds and also convertible note rounds in a little bit. So with that being said and with that introduction of one best, uh, I want to discuss the agenda that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, and the, the agenda is the following. We're going to be talking about the basics of startup investing, also how startup investing can, can be compared to a certain degree to other options, how you really go ahead and make the, the, the pull the trigger on a startup that you're excited about and how that choosing process really works, and then some of the terminology, you know, and, and then what happens once you've made that investment. We will be leaving, uh, I would say, between five to ten minutes at the end to uh, answer some of your questions. In fact, if you have any questions at any time, I have my colleague Nathaniel Kotanch uh, here that is helping me with the, with the ops behind the scenes, and he will be able to answer any of your questions on this panel that you have on your computer on the GoToWebinar. There is a little section there that says questions, so if you type in your question right there, we would be able to either answer the questions for you uh, right there on the spot, or I may be able to go ahead at the end and retrieve those questions and, and also answer it uh, at that moment. But in any case, um, I would prefer if uh, we leave those questions for the end. If you have any problems or any technical difficulties or so forth, just go ahead and also put it on the question section and we would go ahead and, and see how we can help out. So, talking about the basics of startup investing, I think that the most important thing is uh, really to uh, be able to identify or to understand the ecosystem. No? So, as we see here, there is really two different, um, I would say, uh, profile of investors that come into place when we're talking about investing in early stage companies. So, on one end, it will be people like yourselves uh, that they are attending today this, uh, this webinar. This could be uh, called angel investors, right? That's the term that is used for high network individuals or accredited investors that are making investments into startup investment opportunities. This industry is uh, substantial in the US. As you see here, we're looking at almost $23 billion. And then also, um, a, the type of valuations that we're going to be seeing can range uh, all the way up to $3 million, but the average that we're seeing is around $2.7 million or so. So, with that in mind, that's for angel investors. The other end is the venture capital investing. So, these are obviously institutions, uh, and uh, this is a $20 billion industry, and the valuations can go uh, a little bit higher, right? I mean, you can see anything out there, but uh, in the early stages, you're probably seeing about investments that uh, are around $5, five million. So, with that being said, uh, there's other ways or other entities that could come in place, like for example, family offices or private equity firms, but really the ones that are uh, taking charge or really taking the lead are uh, either venture capital firms or angel investors. Angel investors also uh, come in the flavor either as an individual or in the flavor of an angel group. There is angel groups offline that people can join and and then also um, a review and source deals. The beautiful thing about what we're doing today is that you don't need to join an angel group to actually become aware of a deal flow, right? Now, the problem or, or one of the issues with uh, being part of an angel group is the fact that you have to attend their sessions, you need to go to their networking events, and there is, you know, many people that, you know, that could add value, but there, there is some other people that have a ton of responsibilities uh, as being a high executive, for example, that cannot really accommodate in their calendar to actually schedule and, and then also attend. No? So, as you see here, there's quite a lot of companies that are launching every month. Um, they, they, like, like we're seeing here, 575,000 on average. But really, there is a limitation on the type of, on the number of investors. And I think that that really gives an edge to the investors that are sourcing these deals, right? Because, as I mentioned earlier, right now, only qualified 
as accredited investors, we're looking at a million households. So the basics of startup investing, the investments that you're going to be putting into work are going into companies that are privately owned, companies that perhaps have the potential of being a high growth business. And then also um, people can invest that are qualified either as accredited investors or you know, also people would call them high net worth individuals, right? So some of the benefits that would come in with putting an investment in a startup is not only the fact that um, you may have the possibility of having returns on that investment. I mean, obviously, it's a highly liquid mar market. It's a very risky. But then, you know, obviously, with risk, there is some upside reward that can be uh, obtained. Uh, but one of the most interesting things as well is the fact that uh, a, an angel investor or someone that invests in a startup gets the exposure to innovation, right? In the sense that now, for example, you can actually go ahead, review startup investment opportunities, let's say, for example, that are posted on OneBase, and with your own background and with your own expertise and know-how, you can go in and actually help out the entrepreneur. And I think that that's a, a great way of actually spending your time, spending your time with something that you love, something that motivates you, and somewhere where you can actually add value because of all that background that you have. No? So this is, without a doubt, um, a great movement, right? Like, like you can see here on the, on the slides. Uh, there is a, before startups, uh, we're kind of like in a closed circle, but I think that over the past years, like with, for example, with the stories of, of Steve Jobs and, and Facebook and all the movies that we've seen now, it has become more of a, of a bigger thing than what the industry was exposed or used to. Uh, so there's the, the pros and the cons on that, but uh, I'm not going to dive into that today. So startup investing versus other investment options. So let's here, let's stop for a second and let's talk about the different cycles, right? Because I was talking about the different financing cycles that a startup is going to have to go through. And then also the cycles in which you as a startup investor are going to be able to actually dive in and participate. So at the beginning, for the most part, these companies uh, are going to be doing a friends and family round. Those friends and family round uh, tend to be anywhere from uh, 20 to perhaps 150,000. Uh, but then the idea is to build a prototype, to get some of the people involved in the team, and then you would get some momentum, and then you would go and seek some business angels, angel investors, right? Uh, the idea of angel investors is that they're already investing in something that has uh, much of a lower risk as investing, for example, in just the business plan or the uh, PowerPoint presentation, you actually have something more tangible to touch and to see. And that really makes a difference, right? Because at the end of the day, and, my entrep and, and I'm an entrepreneur myself, the issue is that um, you are trying to kind of like express the, a canvas, right, with different type of colors. But uh, ultimately, the other person that is on the other end may not really understand the colors that you have in mind uh, for that canvas in, at the beginning. So when you have a little bit more uh, of a picture, then you can actually go ahead and go to people like yourselves and to convince to join and, and share the journey. So that's the business angels. Normally, uh, angel investor uh, deals range anywhere from 200,000 to uh, perhaps two to three million. Uh, and, and I was already talking about the valuation before, so no need to touch base on that. Venture capital firms, they tend to uh, dive in a little bit uh, later, later stage. So that means that there's already some revenue traction, there is progress on user acquisition on how you're actually attracting your customers in the door. And they can also see a very easy way of, of how that exit is going to look like for them. Normally, an exit of a venture capital firm is they're going after the 10x returns. So as an angel investor, um, uh, when, for example, if the company is doing well and there's no need to, to um, for example, get a venture capital firm involved, then that means that in the event the company is sold or acquired, then for a later of a price, it's, it's going to make more sense for everyone, including the founder. Otherwise, if you get a venture capital firm, they're going to push for a higher valuation and for a higher exit. So to a certain degree, that could uh, create some obstacles in a, you know, obviously making, making an exit. But nonetheless, uh, venture capital firms are very sophisticated. They know what they're doing. And they also have different resources and networks that they can add to the table, right, of the startup. Like, for example, uh, recruiting uh, as well. Um, a, for example, strategy, they would normally take a board seat 
uh, in that company to, 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 to be involved in the overall strategy. And that's something that the angel investor is not really uh, a part of, right? In, in terms of it's not, it's not very um, much, I would say, like market to go in into an angel round and to start, you know, getting board seats in the company. Because at the end of the day, the vision of the, is of the entrepreneur and you need to let the entrepreneur create that future for the company. So the exit, like I was saying, it could be either a merger, an acquisition, uh, or, uh, or, or an IPO. That's going to take a little bit more time. So as you see on this uh, different slide, it's normally between five to eight years in which you're going to get your money back. I mean, companies like Facebook, it took a long time for the initial investors to actually get their money out. So it's very important that you understand as a startup investor that um, it, this is money that you're going to be investing that you're perhaps not even going to see again or not going to see in a long time. It's not like a, investing in the public market where you can sell your position at any point, right, given the, the volume of, of shares that are being sold in exchange. So the ROI, that's a big uh, question mark. I think that you really need to believe in the vision of the company. You need to believe in the founders of the company because ultimately the team is going to be the one accountable for adjusting their business model to whatever the market is, is telling them and so forth, right? So how can I minimize the risk in investing in startups? So I would say that you need to create uh, an investment portfolio, right? Or I would say, you know, not only like it says here, like using discretionary, um, uh, you know, ways to actually invest that money, but the most important, I would say, is to create for yourself an investment framework. And what I mean with this is to create a thesis that you're going to use to actually invest that money into startup companies. So let's say, for example, if you are experienced in, for example, healthcare, then you're going to want to get to see companies that are operating in the healthcare industry that perhaps have a vertical that is similar in which the area in which you are operating as a professional. That could be a way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to uh, create your thesis in the shared economy. That would mean that you would be investing in companies that are, for example, an Uber, a Lyft, a uh, Get Taxi, or, or companies that are really in that vertical, operating in one way or another, so that you can really understand and become an expert, so that not only you are watching out for your investment, uh, but then also perhaps adding value to that company from your findings later on. So another way of of actually investing in startups to minimize the risk could be to uh, get a trusted uh, group of people that can invest with you and really uh, holding yourselves accountable for uh, the outcome, right? Meaning like what, when, when is that money going to be invested and how? So meaning, if, for example, you have a group of four people, for example, that you put together, then if the four don't agree in making that investment, then there's something that, you know, is missing. Obviously, there needs to be a lot of alignment and, and so forth, so that's something that you would have to create for yourself. But that's also a good way to crowdsource, to a certain degree, the due diligence process and really review, reviewing that startup investment opportunity. No? So the next point of the agenda is uh, choosing a startup investment. So for choosing the startup investment, there is uh, a bunch of tips that are very important to actually take into consideration. The most important one I would say is uh, you know, before you dive in or you want to make the investment, you need to review the deal. You need to review the startup. And the three most important factors that one investor in the startup investment um, space would actually take a look at would be one, is the market size because that's really going to determine your exit. I mean, if you're investing in a, in a great company but the market is very small, that is going to really determine what type of ROI you're going to get out of your investment in the event that the company ends up being acquired or sold or, or so forth. So that's one thing. Then the other thing is the team. The team is uh, very, very important, right? Because the team uh, ultimately is going to be iterating, making the pivots, making the adjustments to whatever the market is telling them. And to be quite honest with you, I haven't seen many startups that, or any startup that has come up with a plan, launch the company, and then all of a sudden become an overnight success. That doesn't really happen. Like for example, like they asked the, the founder of Pinterest, uh, who is a very successful uh, founder and also he's built an incredible um, company. They asked him like, what, 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 was, what did this process look like? And he, his answer was, this was an overnight success story of four years. 
So there was a lot of uh, iteration going on there. There was a lot of recruiting. There was a, a lot of uh, financing that needed to be done. So the team is, is crucial to be able to, to attract talent and then also resources to actually expand further the, the opportunity. No? So the other second point here is the, the, you need to be willing to lose your mind. I think that if you are uh, just betting on uh, uh, making money and making money and making money, you know, when you're investing in startups, I would highly uh, uh, recommend you not to look this this type of opportunities because they're very risky. And uh, there needs to be not only the, obviously the potential of making money is, is crucial and is very important, but there needs to be also a motivation for you uh, with that with that problem that that company is resolving, a way for you to add value and a way for you to really be fulfilled by being part of that story. So. The other point, especially coming from a founder, right? What, what can I say about this point is that um, you need to be respectful of the of the startup, right? Of the founders. When you are into fundraising mode as a founder, it's a you're a betting against the clock. Uh, unfortunately, like people say, uh, time is the worst enemy for the startup, but time is the best friend for the investor. And the reason why I say this is because ultimately, the more time that goes by, the more time that you actually get to see how people are executing. But if you're not willing to really make an investment in that company, or you don't, or you don't have your, for example, your 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 due diligence process in place, I would encourage you to really be respectful. I think that the founder would really appreciate that. And and to be quite honest with you, don't be afraid of saying no. Uh, I would I would say that a founder really appreciates the fact that an investor is telling them no because that means that you would give them more time to focus on uh, pursuing other relationships. So these are some of the uh, judgments or important factors that you can take into place when uh, really seeing how accurate the valuation of that company is. I mean, now we're seeing uh, different stories, like for example, Snapchat. I mean, raising money at a $19 billion valuation with a, without a really revenue uh, stream there that is uh, solidified. Uh, you know, some people can argue that you know that's right or that's wrong, but that's 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 the truth. So now you, as an investor, looking at deals, obviously that's more of a growth stage. You're going to see uh, early stages companies on, on our platform, either with valuations that range a, a up to, you know, you never know, like to 2.7, 3, 4, 5, like, you know, early stage uh, companies. But ultimately, you need to make sure that um, you're, you're, you feel comfortable with that, with that value. And the way of doing that is either by trusting the people that have already established the valuation in the business, or uh, perhaps if there is not a lead investor in that company yet, to um, either invest alongside, you know, with other people that are experienced, or to hold off. Because otherwise, the, the last thing that you want to do is to invest without having the, the, the right knowledge or the right expertise if there is no, no terms yet being established. So... Some of the terminology and technical details. I actually um, introduced you guys to, to this before, and this was the, the, the convertible notes versus equity rounds. I mean, that, that's really what you're going to be seeing as an investor in, in this type of stages of seed, series A, and, and bridge rounds. But when we're talking about the, the convertible note, there is a, a few items that you really need to take into consideration or really review in detail. So one is obviously going to be the interest uh, that that company is giving you. Two is going to be the discount that you're receiving. And then three, whether there is or there isn't a cap on that convertible note. So the interest rate is whatever uh, value you're going to be receiving on your money on a yearly basis. Um, as you see here on this example uh, that we took from, from whatever the market right now is, is establishing um, is 8%. Uh, but anyways, I mean, obviously you would have to consult with your financial advisor or your lawyer. Uh, the other thing is the discount, and the way that works is when you are investing in a, in a company via convertible notes, um, if there is, let's say, for example, like is here a 20% discount or whichever discount, that is going to be applied on the valuation of the next round of financing. So normally the way this would work is on angel rounds, um, the, there is a convertible note in place because the founder doesn't feel comfortable putting a value or uh, because there is not, a, not an institution behind that really has all the resources to establish uh, these, these, these valuations. So the way it would work is you're investing on the convertible node, and then there is an institutional round, perhaps a Series A round that is led by a venture capital firm, 
and the venture capital firm would be putting the, the valuation on the company, and then you would be entering or converting your notes, which is debt, into equity, but with a discount over that, uh, uh, that, that valuation that the venture capital firm was establishing. So it's a good way to gain some value right off the bat. The cap, the cap uh, that is established is a good thing as well to uh, give you some security, meaning that, for example, if you are investing in a company and they don't have a cap, let's say you are investing, you know, convertible note round, seed stage or bridge, and the, the company later on uh, raises, uh, you know, a round of financing at, a, let's say, $20 million valuation, that, that means that you would be converting at a $20 million valuation. What the cap really is helping you to do is to set a ceiling, a ceiling in which you're not going to go over. Uh, so, meaning, for example, if uh, you're putting a cap of, you know, let's say, for example, $5 million, then even if the company goes and raises, like on the example that I was saying, a $20 million round, that means that you're still going to be coming under the $5 million cap. So, you're gaining some upside right there, right off the bat. No? So, that's really the, the convertible notes and the way they work. And the, 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 the only three terms that you need to really take a look at on this on this place is the interest, the discount, and then as well the cap. There is less uh, time that is actually invested in convertible notes as, for example, in equity rounds because there's a lot of negotiations and a lot of provisions that there needs to be an alignment between the entrepreneur and the investor. And the convertible notes are, for the most part, cheaper. I mean, if you're looking at the legal bills, you're looking anywhere from like three to 5,000 to really close that. Convertible note round and equity rounds can really get messy, and um, they could go, you know, up north of twenty thousand. So, jumping into the equity round. So, the what I was mentioning is the lead investor. So, the lead investor is that person that is going to come in, is going to be excited enough about whatever the company is doing, and they are going to be establishing a valuation, negotiating all the terms, like for example, on the voting agreement and uh, you know, all the, the, the other four agreements that are in place, but ultimately it's going to be fixing the terms for everyone else to jump in. So um, as you see here, they are going to be putting as well that syndicate, right? So either they're going to be the lead investor bringing in people that they already know, or uh, they're going to be opening it up to other people, uh, like for example, some of the deals that you will be able to find on OneBest. So, with that being said, I know that I've touched a little bit on, on this point, like being able to qualify as an accredited investor. I know that we have, um, but before we launch this poll, I want to I wanna walk you through it. So a qualified accredited investor, as you see here, is either someone that makes over $200,000 a year or that has a net worth uh, north of $1 million. So I want to launch a poll here really quickly, and I want to ask you guys if you have ever... Um, if you think that you are an accredited investor yourself. So let's see. I'm launching the poll right now. You will be able to see the screen on your end. And please reply yes if you think that you are an accredited investor and that you would qualify under the Securities and Exchange Commission definition to invest or if you feel that you're not. And, and then as well, if you're not sure. If you're not sure, I mean, you're right now, I mean, I would encourage you or recommend you to read the screen and then perhaps to see if you can get uh, a little bit more light in this in this aspect. So let's see here. We are going to be closing the poll in four, three, two, one, and we are closing the poll. Perfect. So that was the poll right there. Um, perfect. So now jumping into the next uh, slide. So. Steps, for example, to invest in one best, right? So the first thing that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to pick the startups that you want to invest in. This is, a, you know, certain ingredients, like, for example, like what we were discussing earlier with regards to the investment thesis that you have, where you think that you would be able to add value. Uh, then what's going to happen is once you pick the one that you're excited about, you would be investing. Uh, you would be clicking the, the invest button. And then what happens is that, you're going to be uh, fulfilling all the paperwork that is required. Everything is done online. It's very seamless. And then once that's done, then the transaction would be put into an escrow account. And the, uh, the investment, sorry, will be put into an escrow account. Uh, and this is as a safeguard, meaning that if the startup is not able to achieve the minimum goal or um, it hasn't hit the maximum goal yet, it's not going to be retrieved such amount by the startup until the closing. 
And this is a good way for, for the investor no, to, to be safe because if, for example, the company is looking to raise a minimum of 500,000 to be able to, uh, to, for example, accomplish certain milestones, if they are only allowed, if they're only able to hit, let's say, 200 or 300, then your money is going to be returned to you. And this is going to give you some assurance that there's going to be some execution with the required resources. So this is some of the paperwork that needs to be actually fulfilled by the uh, startup investor. This is quite seamless, by the way. It's all done online. It varies whether the company is either publicly fundraising or privately fundraising. So publicly fundraising is what we're calling uh, be a general solicitation, meaning that you're going all out, as a, as a startup that you're telling the world that you're raising money and uh, there is uh, just a little bit more of homework there to be done uh, by the startup and then as well as you see here by the investor but again it's all done online and then at the end of the day on the form D once the startup needs to fill that out with with a with one more checkbox so it's uh, not that big of a, not that big of a process to actually conduct and then the privately fundraising and uh, that's uh, when it means that the company is either going towards pre-existing relationships or people within their network that they've knew uh, from before. The way it would work on OneVest is actually there's a cooling period of 30 days uh, before you're actually able to invest in one of these companies that are privately fundraising to have access to the terms. So what happens after you make an investment in a startup? I think that this is very important, right? To see how, for example, your uh, money is going to be performing and so forth. The way things are going to work is uh, first you need to make sure that you're aligned with the founder. I think that I find that it's a, it's a little bit tricky, right? Because as an investor, you want to know how your money is performing, but also you need to make sure that you are aware that by reaching out day in, day out to the founder, you're not going to let the founder to execute. And if they have a bunch of investors, then the problem is that they're just going to be doing investor relations all day. So I think that there needs to be uh, certain expectations that are put in place so that you know when and how you're going to be hearing from that founder to tell you about the progress that the company is doing either on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis with regards to revenues, to uh, user acquisition and so forth. I guess obviously it really depends on the business. But then ultimately I would say that without trust and integrity. There is nothing. And this is really a marriage. It's a, as a, a lot of people are saying, it's harder to divorce an investor than to divorce your wife uh, for, you know, obviously the founder and then perhaps for the investor as well. So it's a critical that the entire relationship comes a, from a, it's built from a very good and positive place. And then also, you know, it's, it's, it's kept and maintain uh, that way, right? And that's the reason why expectations and alignment needs to be there. So some of the companies that we've had raising money on uh, one base to give you an idea is, for example, Pristine. It was a telehealth company. They had this application for Google Glass. Uh, pretty cool stuff. They raised with the help 750,000. And then uh, just a couple months later, they were able to raise a Series A with millions of dollars from uh, a couple of venture capital uh, firms. So obviously this is a ton of value in a short term that was uh, uh, given to the investors. Another deal, for example, is SumXR. So SumXR was a, or is an energy drink. They raised 1.3 million with the help of OneBest. And they are one of the best selling energy drinks in uh, Whole Foods right now. So that's a, something that was developed thanks to the people um, like yourselves, uh, angel investors that are willing to invest and then also to push innovation. And uh, we're very proud of, of, of being the platform where that actually you know, happened. So another study, for example, is a co-founders lab. So they were able to raise 680,000 with our help. In fact, we did a merger with them and the co-founders lab now is a sister side of OneBest. But just to give you a quick idea of how it worked out, they um, uh, participated on some of the promotions that we did. Uh, also, one of our advisors um, did, a, did a, a feature on, on tips and tricks of, of profile of founders in which we, for example, included some traits of, 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 of the personality there. But I would say that one of the coolest things that we have, and that I'm going to um, uh, announce later when is the next day when, when this is happening, is the demo days. And the demo days, we were the first ones to introduce this in our industry. And what it is, is you as an investor, you're going to be able to attend one of these demo days. 
which is essentially a webinar session in which you see uh, at least five founders uh, that are training on the platform, pitching their business, uh, defending their business model, answering your questions. And that's a very good opportunity to see from your own point of view how that founder is, 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 is dealing being on the hot seat because ultimately there's going to be a lot of bad days uh, when you're uh, building your company as opposed to the good days and you want to make sure that that person is going to be able to get you know uh, uh, down out of the horse and get back up and continue continue rolling with the with the punches no so yeah I mean after those demo days we also have conference lines where you can call in and ask different questions to the founder and so forth so let me ask you this guys so after all the stuff that we have been discussing about investing in startups and the process and so forth I want to launch here a poll and I want to uh, ask you um, how much are you considering investing in startups if you are even considering investing in startups at all. So here I would actually ask if you want to invest less than, or if you're thinking or considering about investing less than 25,000, uh, anywhere from 25,000 to 50,000, or perhaps uh, more than 50,000 into these same uh, investment opportunities. I think that one of the coolest things about what we're doing with OneBest and being able to invest as, a, as an investor via our platform or via you know, any of the platforms out there doing this kind of thing is the fact that you're able to diversify the risk. And what I mean with this is in the offline world, and let me just take this, this uh, poll, uh, in, well, I'll give you guys uh, a little bit more here to, to respond. But what I mean with diversifying the risk is that in the offline world, before these online startup investing platforms were in place, when you were in the Silicon Valley ecosystem, the minimums were very high to be able to invest in a startup company. I mean, we're talking about uh, anywhere from 60,000 to 150,000. I mean, they were really big. So now what you're able to do is instead of putting all that amount into one single company like you were doing as an angel investor in the offline world, now you're able to go online and to invest, let's say, 100,000 into 100 different companies. And that's going to ultimately help you to find the winners because the rule of thumb when you're investing in companies is the following. One third is going to go out of business from the investments that you're actually making. Another third is going to perhaps break even. And then the rest is going to help you to obtain back all the uh, investments that you've done uh, if they get a successful outcome and an exit. So let me put this poll uh, out in five seconds. Let's get you all to reply here in five, four, three, two, one, and let's see, almost there. Let's close this and we're closing the poll right now if you haven't responded yet. All right, wonderful. So now I want to uh, jump into the next uh, into the next section of uh, our webinar today. We're about to hit the uh, 10 minutes until we um, finally conclude. So I want to jump into the actual Q&A. So if you have any questions now, please go ahead and ask them on the little uh, section that you have on your GoToWebinar control panel. There, insert your question. We will be receiving it on our end. And I would actually be reading it out loud and I would be in answering it for you. So let's see here. Okay. Okay, so here we have um, one question that is, uh, 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 uh. hold on, let's see, because we're getting a ton of questions. So, okay, so the next question is, if we are uh, actually uh, only working for the US. So the companies that we have on the OneBest platform is uh, companies that are US based, is companies that are uh, incorporated and then also operating here in, in, in the country. And uh, for the investors, we do accept foreign investors to actually come in and make uh, transactions. So, so yeah, so I mean, if you are outside of the US, you are actually uh, eligible to come in 
and to look some of the startup investment opportunities that we have. By the way, I was just told that uh, people could not really hear me because of the microphone, so I do apologize for the sound. I hope that now that I'm holding this a little bit tighter, close to my uh, mouth, you guys are able to hear me better. But here, let's go with the next question. It's from Ankur, and his question is, what's the minimum contribution that an investor can actually make in, the, uh, in our platform, for example? So the minimum contribution, it really depends on the founder that's actually set and established by the company. And right now, the minimum contributions that we're seeing are around 5,000, the $5,000 mark. So, um, so yeah, that's something that we're actually doing. But here's the thing. Uh, one of the coolest things about OneVest is that we are creating special purpose vehicles for people to actually invest in them. So that means that, for example, companies that are backed by very sophisticated and top tier venture capital firms that are, for example, not accepting anyone under the $150,000 investment. Now, via OneVest, we actually create these vehicles in which people can invest in and can invest minimums of like, for example, 5,000. So in these vehicles, you can put up to 99 investors and that would actually qualify to, 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 to get into that offering and to, to actually get into that one $150,000 minimum. So, Let's see here. More questions. Keep asking questions. We're actually receiving in, receiving them here. So here, what I receive is, if there is a second round needed for a company, uh, Mick is asking me if I suggest going instead for the second round uh, through the venture capital route. Um, obviously when business has a large revenues and so forth. So my recommendation to that uh, obviously is first to, to, to check with the lawyer for the company or for the investor that is advising the company. And uh, I mean, what I've been seeing is obviously you want to scale this business as soon as possible. Uh, you want to scale it faster than anyone else because the, the, the startup industry, it's a, it, it goes very quickly. I mean, what is right now um, doing a good job, you know, a team that can be doing a good job today, you know, perhaps the next day there's a competing uh, site that comes on board with, uh, you know, either more momentum, more traction, or even more dollars. But ultimately what you want is to make sure that you have uh, a good marketing budget that is going to allow you to compete without other people that are trying to step in. So my uh, recommendation is that the more sophisticated people that the company is able to bring in the door, the better. It's going to help to scale the business faster because as I was mentioning, uh, for example, venture capital firms have these different uh, resources like, for example, in recruiting, in, in, for example, in financing, people that they know for big partnerships, business development deals that could really help the, the company to scale faster. So, yeah, I mean, there's not, not such thing as a either or, and I think that this is a big misconception between using a, for the company OneVest or going to a venture capital thing, uh, a venture capital firm. Both things can be combined, and in fact are combined nowadays, and they, there is no, it's an additional tool really what we're doing at OneVest to be able to accelerate the entire process of the, of the company that is um, um, raising money. So the next question is from Haley. Uh, do you have startups to invest outside of the U.S.? We already answered this one. We do not have startups outside of the U.S. Right now, we're only doing U.S.-based companies. Let's see. Uh, so, which are the key signs of a good and a bad investment? And this is asked by Anwar. I think that this is really something that you need to ask yourself, uh, Anwar, when you're reviewing deals. Um, there is three very important points that you need to really keep into consideration. And these points are obviously the market, the team, and the product. I mean, what, what, what's the size of the market? How, how great the team is? What kind of background do they have? Are they applied to the industry in, in which they're operating in? What, what a, a cycle the product is on? Is it on beta? Is it already capturing revenue? Uh, how many customers, how many, how, how, what's the progress of the customers month over month? I think that those, those are all questions that you need to ask yourself and ultimately that would lead you into knowing and understanding if that could be a good investment or a bad investment. So I have a question here of uh, 
Well, this is this is actually a question from Marco. Marco, thank you so much for for your question. He is asking me, how did you become so successful at only 30 years old? It's actually surprising. Well, first of all, Marco, I don't know where you got my age, but I don't mind sharing it. Yes, I'm I'm, I'm 29, not 30 years old. But I would say that they really what you wanna and, and I'm talking about, for example, um, applying this to to other founders. You wanna have founders that are a that are not gonna give up. That are like cockroaches, right? Just like Paul Graham from Y Combinator says, you need to have people that are willing to roll with the punches. Because when you are a, a founder, there is going to be, you know, the, the, the first days, I mean, the first, you know, let's say year or two years are all going to be fires that you need to put away. Things that are not working, um, adjustments that you need to make for your business. And as a founder, you need to be able to deal with it. And to, if you get, you know, if you fall out of the horse, you need to get back on it. And you need to see that on founders. I mean, to a certain degree, I think uh, some of these demo days or these conference lines that we open to investors are a very good opportunity for the investor to really see how that founder is defending themselves and defending their business when they're on the hot seat. As a founder, you're never going to have all the, all the, all the answers to the questions that the investor is, is throwing your way. But at least, you know, you need to be authentic about it. And, uh, and it's fine that if the founder doesn't know all the, all the answers, as long as they're willing to really, you know, get themselves together and keep pushing, they will, eventually will. And like the book of, uh, uh, what, what's his name? Jim Collins from Good to Great, uh, he did a study on, on, on great companies. And the, what he was able to find is that ultimately a team, um, it's basically like being on a bus. Uh, you don't have initially the direction that you're going to be following. But ultimately, if you have the right people seated on the right seats, you will find that direction. And that's why it is so important for you as investors that you're able to really make sure that that people or those, th that team that is seated on whichever seats of that bus, you feel that ultimately they will find that direction, a direction that would make the company being successful and also a direction that would give you uh, returns on your investment. So let's see the next question. Let's see if you guys can actually make the questions a little bit short and not very long, it will be easier for me to, um, to review. So the next question comes from Roger. So Roger is asking, what is the purpose of establishing a valuation and who ultimately decides what the valuation is? So the purpose of establishing a valuation is uh, really to, to know who is going to own what, right? And what type of dilution, for example, the, the, the startup is going to, the founders are going to experience or the people that are really already part of the cap table. The equity or the evaluation that is established, it's going to be done by the lead investor like I was mentioning before, this could be either a very sophisticated angel investor who has invested in several startups in the past and that uh, you know, perhaps could open different doors uh, down the road or add value, uh, or it could be as well a venture capital firm. So uh, that's the reason why uh, I was talking about two different ways to really raise a round of funding. So one is either via the convertible notes, there is no need for a lead investor or no need for evaluation. This is ultimately something that startups explore because they don't feel perhaps comfortable establishing a value of their company yet because maybe they feel that it could have more potential or less potential at that point uh, than what people can perceive it. And then equity rounds, I guess that it's, a, it's good if you have sophisticated people looking at the deal and then feeling comfortable about putting a valuation depending on what they've seen in the past or depending on what the market is actually doing with companies that have um, a, a similar type of operations or that are operating in that type of, of vertical. So uh, the next question comes from Eddie. So what are the requirements for startups to be a part of your network? So in order for a startup to be a part of our network, I mean, obviously you can be a part of our network via the co-founders lab sister site. If you wanna meet co-founders and uh, for example, meet advisors and interns and so forth. Um, but the, the ultimately, ultimately the thing to be able to launch on the, um, I would say platform of OneBase is the fact that first you're able to have some, some momentum, some traction uh, that you have perhaps over 20% of the round already committed uh, and in the bank and that you have a certain potential that ultimately is going to lead uh, us, uh, the company, the startup onboarding team, and then also our broker dealer 
to believe that uh, you have the potential of giving returns back to the investors because ultimately for us, um, we don't really see the success on how much uh, companies are able to raise, but more on how much investors were able to get uh, as a return on the investment that they did via our platform. We have on the resource section, uh, you will be able to see for investors and then as well for entrepreneurs, many of these questions answered and then some of the guidelines to qualify as a startup to really, to really be on the platform. But ultimately, you really need to have these ingredients that I was mentioning and then as well uh, to have the potential to be a high growth business that would give money to investors in that horizon that we're seeking. No? So that's why pizzerias and, and, and restaurants would ultimately not qualify. It's for the most part companies that have that technology component. So let's see here. So I think that, let me, let me check. Okay, so it's 2 p.m. So guys, I mean, we have so many questions here. Uh, I would love to actually go through all of them, but uh, yeah, we would be here, you know, uh, uh, more than more than one hour. So I apologize if I was not able to really go through all your questions. So the uh, next webinar or the next demo day that we're going to have is going to be on February the 24th. So I'm going to launch a little poll here, and uh, I'm going to ask if you would like to be invited. So please uh, reply yes or no, and we would be in touch with you to um, obviously verify that in fact you qualify to to um, perhaps add value. I mean, I'm not saying that, that you would never add value, but to add value as an accredited investor, right? Because sometimes there's a lot of service providers and we wanna make sure that our experience, the experience of investors, and then as well the experience of startups are is curated enough to have people living on a good note, those events. And this next event that we're gonna have, by the way, please keep uh, replying yes or no, don't be shy. And by the way, these, uh, these demo days are, as I mentioned, a good way for you to actually connect uh, on a personal note with the founder and then on a, on, on a business note, right? Because you're going to be able to ask all the concerns that perhaps you have in mind. So let's see. Let's keep uh, answering these uh, questions. We have right now 70%. By the way, we had over 1,000 people registered for this event. I couldn't be happier and honored to have you guys on the line. So uh, let's close this poll in five four, three, two, one, and we are closing the poll, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. All right, so the last slide that I want to cover with you all is uh, we have this section. It's called learn.onebest.com. There you will be able to find articles that are going to help you and educate you as an investor on what to do uh, in order to review deals, to really get involved and, and get your feet wet with uh, the startup ecosystem. So you will find articles, videos, uh, some news uh, in there as well. But anyways, you can, as uh, you see here, follow me on a, a, like we would say in Spanish, a cremades. I say a cremades when I'm here so that people are able to really understand with the accent. So thank you for your patience because I know that the Spanish accent is thick. So I really do appreciate the patience that you had with that uh, today during the session. I am very thankful for having you all on the line. It was definitely um, a pleasure and an honor to be your host today during this uh, webinar session. And I very much look forward to having you all being part of our uh, community. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to send them along my way. My email is alejandro at onevest.com. I'll make sure that those concerns are addressed with some of our team uh, members in the investor relations team. And again, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure, and I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of the week. Take care. Bye-bye.